An avatar of Cain is an ancient god incarnate. Those who follow him into battle are invigorated by his fearsome presence. Their fears or hesitations eradicated and replaced with a fierce anticipation of conflict and a near insatiable murder lust. In these moments, the Asurnyani are transformed from tragic survivors into the glorious conquerors their forebears once were. When not roused for war, a craft world's avatar sits upon a smoldering throne inside a sealed wraithbone chamber. A towering statue of iron, the avatar's heavily muscled form is pitted with age and encrusted with corrosion. His armor is ornately adorned with runes, gemstones, and more, while emblems representing the various aspect shrines hang from belts around his waist and chest. His slitted eyes reveal only empty darkness. The skeletal structure of the Avatar's sanctum stretches through the entire craft world and links into every part of his inert form. Thus is he fundamentally connected to the craft world, and it to him. When the Asurnyani of his world ship prepare for war, the Avatar's psychically receptive chamber pulses with their increasing battle lust. Molten iron boils through his veins, and his whole body crackles and hisses like a furnace. He shifts upon his throne, restless with a craving for bloodshed. As the Avatar senses the craft world's growing desire for war, the Asurnyani in turn feel his first stirrings reverberating through the wraithbone core of their craft world. Thus, the war lust of the Asurnyani is accelerated further in a feedback loop that eventually reaches fever pitch. With the Avatar slowly rousing, Exarchs don their ceremonial armor, gather outside his sanctum, and, if they feel the Avatar is needed in the battles to come, begin the ritual of awakening. This act causes the Avatar to admit a psychic roar that echoes across the craft world. This great battle cry is the signal for the Exarchs to bring forth the young king, an aspect warrior chosen by the Farseers for a potentially dread destiny. If the Exarchs choose to carry out the ritual of awakening, the bronze doors of the Avatar's sanctum will swing open. Then, the young king, naked save for a wraithbone crown of thorns, strides in. By this point, the Avatar's stirring has caused his chamber to resemble a great furnace. Its light so bright, it burns the mind and the sound of splintering iron deafening. Behind the warrior, the gates close. For hours, sometimes days, the chamber rumbles and booms, drowning out the agonized screams of the young king within. Finally, with a terrible roar, a psychic shock wave blasts open the chamber doors, and through them advances the Avatar. None speak of the fate of the young king, not even the far seers. At this point, another will be anointed in his place. 
When fully roused, the avatar's eyes glow like coals, and as he moves, his whole surface ripples and spits, fiery ichor bursting and solidifying upon his incandescent skin. Tendrils of smoke and flying cinder wreathe him like a dark cloak, and he reeks of the hot smell of burnt blood and sulfur. Thick red gore drips from the fingers of his left hand, while in his right he carries the Wailing Doom, the sacred weapon of the bloody-handed god, which may manifest in a number of forms, such as a sword, axe, or spear. Armed with this instrument of death, the Avatar becomes all but unstoppable capable of striking down greater demons, carving through armored vehicles, and slaying monsters. Eldari mythology tells that at the moment of its birth, Slanesh slaughtered almost all of the Eldari pantheon and stole the god's power, with only two of their number surviving the fall. Kayla Mensha Cain the strongest and most warlike of the Eldari deities, endured through might. Slanesh and the bloody-handed god fought a titanic battle in the warp, and despite Cain's mastery of war, Slanesh, glutted with stolen power, eventually proved the stronger. Exhausted from the struggle, Slanesh could not destroy the Eldari god completely. Instead, Cain was rent into fragments. Each shard came to rest within the wraithbone core of a craft world, where it took root and grew into an avatar of the bloody-handed god. The other god to survive was Sigarak, while Slanesh fought with Cain, the Laughing God escaped into the webway and hid amongst its myriad tunnels. Tales suggest that he remains there still, unassailable, laughing at the gods of chaos as he hatches bitter plans for revenge. There are those who claim that Sigarak walks amongst his children from time to time wearing the disguise of an anonymous Harlequin player. Dire Avengers Merciless to their foes and unstinting in their devotion to their people, Dire Avengers represent the war god's unending thirst for vengeance upon a galaxy of woe. Regarded by many as the most tactically flexible and noble of all the aspects, they form a cornerstone of almost any craft world's battle plans. Dire Avengers take to the field armed with Avenger Shuriken catapults, elegant weapons even more advanced than those used by a craft world's guardians. Their lethal volleys echo the death of a thousand blades, the punishment that Cain meets out upon traitors and cheats who are unworthy of a clean kill. The dire avengers consider the wielding of the shuriken an art form even when they are not clad in their full panoply of war, the robes they wear when outside their shrines are lined with lethal discs. In this way, even an apparently unarmed dire avenger can slay a distant opponent with a swift chopping gesture, a skill much needed in times of strife. Such vigilance is the hallmark 
of the dire avenger aspect, a symbol of their duty to guard their craft world at all times, and to take the battle to their enemies at a moment's notice. Osirman is the first and oldest of the Phoenix Lords. In the aftermath of the fall, he founded the first of the Aspect Warrior Shrines upon a world later called Asir by his followers in honor of him. By Asirman was the path of the warrior opened forever, and the first Aspect Warriors, the Asira, were honed by him personally. He strengthened them in both mind and body, for the dangers of the galaxy were many, and the surviving Eldari few. Asirman knew that his decadent people needed to be made strong in the face of this new stark reality. Thanks to his teachings, his followers became sharper than any blade. Asirman went on to found more shrines on more craft worlds than any other of the Phoenix Lords. And so dire avengers are the most numerous kind of aspect warriors fielded by the armies of their craft worlds. Asirman's skills at war are breathtaking, representing the zenith of the dire avenger aspect. He bears wrist-mounted shuriken catapults, known to the Eldari as Asira Vanda, though in the human tongue they are known as the Bloody Twins. He also carries the ancient sword of Asir, first of the dire swords. Bound within this blade's hilt is the spirit stone of Asirman's brother, Hethesis, that he too may continue the fight against the servants of the great enemy until the end of time. Warp Spiders The Warp Spiders take their name from the tiny crystalline arachnoids that crawl throughout a craft world's infinity circuit and dome of crystal seers. Slipping in and out of existence, these diminutive yet aggressive entities act as an immune system for the world ship's wraithbone skeleton, hunting invasive psychic shadows and demon predators that are drawn like carrion eaters to spirit stones. Warp spiders epitomize the doctrine of aggressive defense, striking without warning from an unseen quarter. They do this with an arcane dimensional device that allows them to mimic the way their namesakes teleport around the craft world. A compact warp generator housed within their armored backpack. Warp spiders can make short warp jumps disappearing and reappearing in the blink of an eye. This enables them to launch totally unexpected attacks on their foes. Such a tactic is not without substantial risk, however, for it necessitates the aspect warriors spending a short time in the hell dimension of the warp. The Immaterium is a perilous place for any soul to travel. The risk is greatest of all for the Eldari, for their immortal foe, Slanesh, constantly thirsts for their souls. A journey through the warp, however brief, is a matter of incredible danger. Not only may it draw the attention of she who thirsts, the demons that inhabit that realm all delight in ensnaring Eldari spirits, 
and making them their playthings for eternity. For this reason, the warp spiders are considered by the Osirnani to be among the bravest of all aspects. They risk not only their lives in the name of victory, but also their eternal souls. It is the task of the warp spider exarchs to guide their charges through the perilous and intricate processes required to survive warp jumps, showing them how to steal their mind and spirit to endure the horrors that await them. The ritual armament of the warp spider is the death spinner, an exotic and highly advanced weapon that extrudes a cloud of razor-sharp monofilament wire. The spinner's magnetic containment field spools this together and hurls it towards the enemy. The wire's tension causes it to writhe and lash in the air, and where it touches soft tissue, it slices through with horrible ease severing limbs and dicing flesh. Shining Spears The Shining Spears possess a bright and clear virtue that marks each one of their number out as a warrior champion of their race. Eldari mythology is replete with examples of noble heroes at one with their steeds, and in the Shining Spears, the glories of legend are made manifest. The anti-gravitic motors of Shining Spears' sleek, gleaming jet bikes allow them to skim over even the roughest terrain at breakneck pace. Such is their focus that the shining spears can weave through dense jungles and crumbling architecture without slowing, dodging around obstacles that would cause spectacular collisions and explosive endings for riders of lesser skill. Shining spears are so in tune with their jet bikes that they can execute complex aerial maneuvers with only subtle movements of their hands upon their control consoles. They instinctively know the absolute limits of their mounts, confidently throwing them into vertical climbs and dazzling corkscrew spins that even the most gifted pilots of other races cannot hope to match. Such skills are honed through countless years spent with their aspect shrines, vast structures that would take days to traverse on foot. It is said that while preparing themselves in these facilities, the Shining Spears never leave the saddle, even when engaged in meditation and that they can feel the flow of the land beneath them through the slightest variations in the hum of their jet bikes, steering confidently even with their eyes shut tight. In battle, this ability allows them to swerve and jink with preternatural ease, making it all but impossible for enemy gunners to draw a bead upon them. The rune used by the Shining Spears is a triangular warrior sigil graced with a lightning bolt dancing from each of its sides. It promises a quick, painful, and inescapable death to the enemies of the Osirnyani, something these aspect warriors are eager to deliver. In battle, the Shining Spears fight as the Spear of Cain, which struck like lightning and killed with a single ruinous blow. The 
the warriors of this aspect are famous for the sheer daring and persistence of their attacks. After delivering a flurry of shots and blows with their formidable laser lances, they will disengage and circle back towards their foe, barely slowing in the process before charging again. The energy blasts their fearsome weapons unleash whittle through the foe's front ranks, leaving the way clear for them to slam into the troops beyond with a devastating, piercing impact. Howling Banshees A predominantly female aspect, Howling Banshees are incredibly swift and deadly warriors who race towards their foes with acrobatic grace. Experts in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, their dueling style is a perfect example of combat efficiency and precision. With every rapid thrust and slash, their powered blades make a mockery of their foe's armor. The Howling Banshees announce their arrival on the battlefield with a dire, blood-chilling scream that is amplified into a mind-destroying shockwave by their banshee masks. This oral assault inflicts severe damage to the central nervous systems of their foes. The aspect's rune reflects this. Known as the Reign of Tears, it represents the depthless sorrow of the Banshees of Eldari myth. It is said that these beings used this raw emotion to steal the souls and freeze the blood of those exposed to it. Howling Banshees are led by their exarchs, who train them in quicksilver swordplay and the use of of the shriek that kills. So piercing are the Exarch's own war cries that they haunt their victims long after the screams have died away. The Howling Banshee's Phoenix Lord was the first Eldari to learn under the tutelage of Osirnmen. It was Jane Zar who perfected and taught the scream that steals. And her own psychosonic barrage is so powerful, it can liquefy the brains of her victims. To this day, Jane Zar is a devoted matriarch, visiting her shrines and nurturing her spiritual descendants. No other Phoenix Lord is as committed to the war against the great enemy. And on countless occasions, Jane Zar has led hundreds of howling banshees to war. Furthermore, no other Phoenix Lord has championed the growing cause of the Inari more than her. And she has come to their aid multiple times. The Banshee is a harbinger of woe in Eldari mythology, whose cry is said to herald such ill fate that it can even wrench a soul from its spirit stone. It is fitting that the most feared of all the aspect warriors, the Howling Banshees, draw their inspiration from this unearthly creature. In Eldari myth, the crone goddess, Morai Heg, sought to partake of the wisdom contained in her divine blood. Knowing there was only one with the power to harm a god, she sent her daughters to haunt their father Cain's steps with their piercing screams. The infernal noise drove Cain into a bloody rage 
that saw his mind begin to unravel. Promising an end to this curse, the crone goddess bade Cain cut off her hand so that she might drink deep from her own veins. With this deed, Morai Heg gained the knowledge of blood, and the aspect of the banshee was granted to Cain in return. Striking Scorpions Like stalking shadows, the striking scorpions hunt their prey across dark and dust-choked battlefields. The thick psychoreactive plates of their armor slide across their bodies without a sound as they ready their shuriken pistols and diamond-tipped chain swords for the ambush to come. When their trap is sprung, however, the striking scorpions discard all stealth and leap keenly into battle. Striking scorpions are merciless killers without exception. They have made fear their closest ally and revel in the hunt and the kill. The aspect's most sinister skill is the legacy of their phoenix lord, Garandras. The ability to become one with the shadows and thus creep towards targets without ever being seen. Striking scorpions are masters of maximizing every potential hiding place as they slink through terrain. Their patient yet murderous nature has been the doom of many an enemy whose attention drifted from the shadows for even a moment. They have been known to emerge unexpectedly from cover right at the heart of the foe, wreaking so much havoc that they have single-handedly turned entire battles. The signature attack of a striking scorpion is made by the devices housed in the pods on either side of the warrior's helmet, known as Manda Blasters. These short-ranged weapons deliver a deadly energy sting in close combat. Activated by a psychic pickup, they fire a hail of needle-thin shards that act as conductors for a highly charged laser. The foe scarcely has time to reel in shock at the sudden appearance of the Aspect Warriors before the Manda Blaster sting hits home, wounding or killing its target. Capitalizing on the advantage provided by their opening volley, the striking scorpions then deliver a blistering flurry of blows, pressing home more and more attacks before their overwhelmed prey can recover. The symbol of these aspect warriors is the scorpion rune, which represents the slow, stalking killer and the sudden blow. Two aspects of war perfected by the striking scorpions. The emblem has dark connotations in Eldari myth, and is no sign of nobility, but the aspect warriors wear it with pride nonetheless. Amongst the most mysterious and menacing of the Phoenix Lords, Karandras rarely speaks, and never breathes a word of his origins. It is from him that the striking scorpions learned the sinister patience of the hunter. He goes to war wielding a mighty claw named Aurora's Bane, a great biting blade known in the Eldari tongue as the Izum of Rithro, and a Manda Blaster of surpassing craftsmen called the Scorpion's Bite. Grandras is not the oldest of the striking Scorpion Exarchs. 
for that honor belongs to Rara, the father of scorpions. Aura was the most sinister of all the Phoenix Lords. The fallen Phoenix, who, some rumors claim, burns with the dark light of chaos. Karandras is said to have dueled his rival for weeks, forcing Aura's defection before taking his place and tempering his murderous nature with the patience of the hunter. It is whispered in the shattered reaches of the webway that Aura still lives, that he fled to the darkest corners of Eldari civilization to begin his bloodthirsty teachings anew. Many of these voices claim that Aura defected to the Dark Kin, the Drakari, where he founded an order of merciless warriors who fight in his name. Dark Reapers The skull-helmed visage of the Dark Reapers is a spine-chilling sight in itself. But to the Eldari, it has a symbolism altogether darker than simple death. These aspect warriors exemplify the war god as destroyer, and their formidable war suits echo that of their founder, Malgan Ra, also known as the Harvester of Souls. This Phoenix Lord is among the most grim and foreboding of all Asurnyani. The credo that the kiss of death can be delivered from afar with grace and ruthless efficiency is central to the way of the reaper. Their role is one of long-ranged fire support, and their midnight-colored armor incorporates a complex set of interlocking plates and powered limbed supports that absorb the recoil of their weapons. Advanced helmet-mounted sensor vanes allow the Dark Reapers to lock on to fast-moving targets, while a sophisticated mind link enables them to see from the muzzles of their weapons, improving their accuracy still further. Added together, these capabilities make it all but impossible to evade the Dark Reaper's fire. Much of the punishing training these aspect warriors undertake is dedicated to making the perfect shot. They are expected to display incredible feats of coordination, focus, and balance giving them an unflinching and obsessive nature. Should Dark Reapers fail in battle, they must atone for it once they return to their shrine. Of Osirn Men's pupils, Maugen Ra was the most independent. He fashioned Baroque occult weapons preferring dark and malefic artifacts that could slay his foes from afar. As his craft progressed, he learned that even the most outlandish armaments could be used with the precision of a scalpel. This, combined with his mastery of every element of ranged combat, dictated the disciplines of the Dark Reaper aspect. Malgan Ra hails from the craft world Altanasar, a world vessel that, despite the valiant efforts of its people, was pulled into the Eye of Terror after the fall. Only Malgan Ra escaped, and his daring efforts 10,000 years later to rescue his lost people are recounted 
in the macabre Bas Fenicillier lays. His kin suffered much during their millennia trapped in the warp, and thus the harvester of souls, hatred for the servants of the dark gods, knows no bounds. Fire Dragons The Fire Dragon Aspect Warriors style themselves upon the dragon of Eldari myth, the sinuous, fire-breathing reptile that represents wanton destruction. Fire dragons are masters of wielding weapons that use heat and fire, and take savage delight in the devastation they cause. Such is their affinity with fire that it is not unheard of for their exarchs to manifest a burning corona when consumed with battle lust. Every fire dragon undergoes many hazardous trials and rituals to hone their abilities. Thanks to this training, they know at a glance which parts of a target will be most susceptible to their weapons. This transcends the mere study of schematics and becomes as much spiritual knowledge as tactical expertise. It is said that fire dragon exarchs know instinctively how to destroy any armored behemoth with just a single shot, even if they have never seen that particular engine of war before. The ritual weapons of the fire dragons are fusion guns. These can reduce otherwise impenetrable armor plating to a cloud of superheated vapor in a single moment. The Osirnyani fusion weapons cause the molecules of the target to hyper-vibrate, generating so much heat that the victim bursts into flames before turning to molten liquid and then evaporating. Fire dragons also carry discus-shaped fusion charges, which they attach to their enemies' fortifications and lumbering war engines, before detonating them with a psychically delivered triggered word. Nowhere is safe from the white-hot rage of these aspect warriors. A truth made all the clearer by their wide usage of falcon grav tanks to close with their chosen foe. Fugin is the phoenix lord of the fire dragons and the founder of the aspect. He has schooled his disciples in mastering the powers of the dragon rather than regarding oblivion only as a force of discord. He hopes that through selective destruction, the Eldari can bring harmony. To the Osirnyani, Fugin is a mighty hero, often depicted holding the cosmic serpents of wisdom and entropy in his fiery grasp. Fugin has devoted himself fully to the destruction of the Osirnyani's enemies, pitilessly eradicating them one by one. He has spent the millennia traveling the ancient tunnels of the webway, emerging only when it serves his noble cause. Of late, the flames of Fugan's fire pike, Searsong, have burned hotter and more often than ever before. Legend tells that the Burning Lance will be the last of the Phoenix Lords to fall in the final battle against Chaos, the end of all days. Swooping Hawks In ancient times, the Eldari believed that the spirit of someone murdered would pass into a hawk and hover above the killer 
is a mark of guilt. The swooping hawks take their name from these wild hunting birds, for they are synonymous with vengeance and retribution. The war gear of the swooping hawks is fashioned from fine cellular material, cunningly constructed so as to be astonishingly light. Their wings, made from vibrating feather plates and incorporating small gravitic lifters, enable them to soar far above the battlefield with incredible grace, speed, and agility. Swooping hawks can launch high into the air at a moment's notice before descending upon their foes. Their exarchs teach them the intricacies of flight and how to perform daring sky leaps in the heat of battle. They learn to harry the enemy's flanks with salvos from their las blasters and disrupt hostile maneuvers with attacks from above. In addition to las blasters, swooping hawks carry grenade packs loaded with anti-personnel and anti-tank explosives. Soaring overhead, they bombard enemy positions with these sophisticated devices, sowing destruction with a hail of plasma detonations. All Osernyani who look upon the majestic glow of the swooping hawks find their morale bolstered. This is in no small part because of what they represent. Just as the Aspect's winged warrior room speaks of a return to a position of ascendancy after a period of darkness, so the swooping hawks symbolize the heights of greatness to which all Eldari aspire. Baharoth was the first exarch to master aerial combat and was the founder of the Swooping Hawk Shrines. The most vibrant and youthful of the Phoenix Lords, he reveled in the sensation of sunlight on his wings. Despite their differences, Baharoth and Malgan Ra share a deep bond. They are brothers as the sun is to the moon, and many of the Eldari's deadliest foes have met their doom on the edge of their blades. The Osernyani consider Baharoth's presence a sign of victory to come, for he appears above the battlefield a glorious hero, shining with a brilliance of his own making, looping and soaring through flak-churned skies, the cry of the wind looses pinpoint blasts of blinding fire from his bespoke hawk's talon, the fury of the tempest. He is also a master of close quarters combat, and strikes with the resplendent sword known is the Shining Blade. Legend tells that this elegantly curved weapon was forged by the daughters of Val in the dying fires of a supernova, and that some of that long-gone star's power lives on, captured within the sword's impossible gleam. According to the Osiryata, Baaroth's final death will come at the Ranadandra. All Aldari fear that this apocalyptic event will happen in their lifetime. The forces of Chaos Ascendant and Phoenix Lords being sighted with greater frequency, these fears might be well placed. Crimson Hunters the ritual war gear of the Crimson Hunters is not a blade or a sidearm, but a sleek aerial fighter that represents the pinnacle of Osernyani aeronautics. 
known as nightshade interceptors, these formidable craft are specially designed to hunt down and destroy enemy aircraft of any kind. They are just as much part of the Crimson Hunter's battle gear as the power swords of the Howling Banshees or the wings of the Swooping Hawks. The aspect shrines of the Crimson Hunters are unlike any other. They are not buildings or landscapes, but tunnel-linked collections of transparent atria that float around the periphery of their craft worlds. It is within these realms of captive sky that the Crimson Hunters duel. Their weapons of choice, the potent laser and plasma weapons, gracing each nightshade interceptor's curving fuselage. During these breakneck training battles, the Crimson Hunters set these armaments only to illuminate rather than to pierce the armor. With this technique, they learn exactly how to avoid the most dangerous enemy munitions and fight in the most realistic circumstances without suffering losses to friendly fire. In these relentless exercises, as in war, the Crimson Hunters are led by their Exarchs, the most skilled of their kind. These peerless marksmen rarely fail to strike their targets, even when moving at maximum speed. By training against their own peers, some of the most gifted fighter pilots in the galaxy, the Crimson Hunters ensure that the act of destroying the aircraft of lesser races is a simple exercise, and one that proves the superiority over the comparatively sluggish pilots that pollute the skies of the galaxy. The Crimson Hunters embody the war god Cain's ability to leave a more powerful foe reeling and ready for slaughter. Weaving through whole squadrons of enemy aircraft, doubt maneuvering larger foes, they use their immense firepower to destroy priority targets, taking next to no damage in return. It has to be this way. For the Asunyani, victory heavy with losses is hardly victory at all. Their race cannot afford wars of attrition on the ground or in the air. To survive, the craft worlds must always be capable of defeating foes of vastly greater numbers. <laughs>